2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 it's not an easy passage and not a very palatable one but a very important one just a few verses 614 of 2 Corinthians through to 7 1 it's the little bit of this morning's study I left out so that we could take it separately do not be mismated with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and iniquity or what fellowship has light with darkness what accord has Christ with Belial that's another name for Satan or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever what agreement has the temple of God with idols for we are the temple of the living God as God said I will live in them and move among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people therefore come out from from them and be separate from them says the Lord and touch nothing unclean then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty since we have these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God I'm going to read now a very remarkable prayer written about 250 years ago and yet when I read this prayer which appears in the novel Sir Charles Grandison it seemed as if it was written for 1971 the language is a little archaic in places and yet the struggle that the writer had that this man had to live a holy life in his society is very similar to our battle today let's bow our heads and use it as a prayer let thy law almighty be the rule and thy glory the constant end of all I do let me not build virtue on any notions of honor but of honor to thy name let me not sink piety in the boast of benevolence or to lose my love of God in the love of my fellow creatures can good be of human growth no it is your gift almighty and all good let not thy bounties remove the donor from my thought nor the love of pleasures make me forsake the fountain from which they flow when joys entice let me ask their title to my heart when evils threaten let me see thy mercy shining through the cloud and discern the great hazard of having all to my wish in an age of such license let me not take comfort from the number of those who do amiss an omen rather of public ruin than of private safety let the joys of the multitude not allure but alarm me and their danger not example determine my choice what weight public example passion and the multitude in one scale against reason and the almighty in the other in this day of domineering pleasure so reduce my taste that I may not relish the comforts of life and in this day of dissipation oh give me thoughts sufficient to preserve me from being so desperate as in this perpetual flux of things to depend on tomorrow a dependence that is the ruin of today as that is of eternity let my whole existence be ever before me nor let the terrors of the grave turn back my survey when temptations arise and virtue staggers let my imagination sound the final trumpet and judgment lay hold on eternal life in what is well begun grant me to persevere and to know that none are wise except they who determine to be wiser still and since O Lord the fear of thee is the beginning of wisdom 
and in its progress, its surest shield, turn the world entirely out of my heart, and place that guardian angel, thy blessed fear, in its place. Turn out a foolish world which gives its money for what is not bread, which hews out broken cisterns that hold no water, a world in which even they whose hands are mighty have found nothing. There is nothing, Lord God Almighty, in heaven and earth but Thee. I will seek Thy face, bless Thy name, sing Thy praise, love Thy law, do Thy will, enjoy Thy peace, hope Thy glory until my final hour. Thus shall I grasp all that can be grasped by men. This will heighten good and soften evil in the present life, and when death summons me, I shall sleep sweetly in the dust till his mighty conqueror bids the trumpet sound, and then shall I, through his merits, awake to eternal glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The little passage that I just read to you has suffered a great deal at the hands of commentators. At first sight, it seems a real interruption in the letter to the Corinthians, and it, the atmosphere of these few verses is so different from what immediately goes before and what follows that there have not been wanting commentators who said that this little bit doesn't belong here at all. Some would go so far as to say that it can't have been written by Paul himself and that it has been pushed in later by someone with a narrower mind than he had just to try and get it into the Bible. Others have not gone quite as far. Some have said that this was not written by Paul, the Christian, but by Saul, the Pharisee. In other words, it's a throwback to the days before he became a Christian and that he's going back to his narrow days as a Pharisee. I suppose the mildest suggestion is that this doesn't belong to this letter, but is a little mi misplaced paragraph from what he called his painful letter, his severe letter, which he wrote and told off the Corinthians roundly for certain wrong things they were doing. I want to say, not because I'm perverse or I hope prejudiced, that I think all these scholars are wrong and that this little paragraph belongs squarely in the middle of this chapter. I know that you could cut it out and you could read smoothly straight on without it. Look, for example, if you've got your Bible, at verse 11, just before it. It says, Our mouth is open to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Now go straight on to verse 2 of chapter 7. Open your hearts to us. You see, there's no break. It seems to go straight on. Is there any possible explanation why, in the middle of an appeal to open their hearts, to be unreserved in their affection and love, Paul should suddenly butt in with such a strong warning about human relationships? I think there is. And I can see, I think, exactly why he put it in at this point and interrupted his appeal with this warning. There is a desperate need among Christians to widen hearts, to be unrestricted in affection, to love one another fully. Christians will not get a lot of love in the world, but they should get a lot of love in the church. And this is the divine compensation for the troubles of the Christian life to support you in those troubles with the love of Christians whose hearts are wide open to you. He is pleading for more emotion in religion. He's pleading for more feeling, more love and affection flowing not from the mind but from the heart. He's not talking about the mind now, he's talking about the heart. Indeed, if I were going to be quite literal, he uses the word kidneys which is translated in the authorized version, I believe, bowels, but it means what you feel deep down here. Not what you think up here, but open your deep feelings to one another. Feel for each other down here. He's pleading for a flow of affection. Why then does he suddenly interrupt like this? I'll tell you why. 
because there are limits even to Christian affection. There are limits beyond which your heart must not carry you. There is always a danger when love is released, when affections are flowing freely, for Christians to get entangled in relationships that are not going to help them. There is always a danger when the heart is free that the heart takes over from the head. And this is an unscriptural balance. The head must always keep the heart in place. Let the heart be wide open, but let the head keep control, for your head is meant to keep the control. Your heart is a vital part of your life. You can't live without feelings. You can't be a Christian without feelings. But they must never run away with you into a wrong relationship. Or I could put it this way. Paul is pleading for an open affection among believers. He is now going to say, but watch your affections for unbelievers. And this is why he puts this little warning in. Having given it, he goes straight back to the appeal to open wide their hearts. And it is in little sandwiches like this that Paul keeps the balance in his teaching. It is so easy to get unbalanced in the Christian life, to get one-sided, lopsided, either overemphasizing the intellectual part so that you've got it all up here and that's all, or overemphasizing the emotional side so that you run away with feelings into all kinds of highways and byways that you shouldn't be treading. Balance, keeping the thing together. And so he interrupts his appeal for more feeling and affection with a warning about the wrong relationships that your heart can lead you into. He is going to deal with the thorny question of separation. And it's not a subject I would choose to preach on, but I find the discipline of working through the Bible very good for me. It's a subject that has got out of balance again and again in Christian fellowship. On the one hand, there have been those who've carried the doctrine of separation to such extremes that Christians won't even eat with the members of their own family, won't allow people to join the automobile association or have any link at all with people who are not Christians. That is just not practical. If Paul had meant that, he would never have said in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, I did not mean that you must not associate with men of the world. To do that, you would have to go out of the world altogether, he says. You can't disassociate yourself from unbelievers, and it would be utterly wrong to do so. My milk is brought every morning, as far as I know, by an unbeliever. But I'm happy to drink it. It gives me a link with him. We are in association. My postman, as far as I know, is an unbeliever. But I have an association. Everywhere you go, you must associate with unbelievers. This doctrine of separation is carried to an illogical and impractical extreme if it is taken to mean that you cannot associate with people who are not Christians. That is the extreme to which the Pharisees took religion. And the word Pharisee means separated one. And it was a nickname given to those who, if they brushed up against someone in the marketplace, ran home and changed their clothes and had a bath. That's the extreme of separation to which the Pharisees carried their religion. And that's the reason why Jesus bumped right into them and ran up against them. They hated him and he condemned them, said whited sepulchres. You're so keen to get separated from people that you don't get separated from unclean things. And he didn't get on with the Pharisees at all. And they didn't get on with him because they said, look, he's a friend of sinners. He goes into their houses and has meals with them. So that Paul, following Jesus, is not here going back to his Pharisees' days of not having any association with those who are not Christians. If you don't befriend sin sinners, however will they get saved? If you're not prepared to associate with the ungodly, what hope is there for them? Let's avoid this extreme. But I would think that the greater danger among Christians today is the opposite of extreme, of thinking that you can go anywhere and mix with anybody and do anything. 
Now you're a Christian. I think that is the greater danger. And I've got to try and walk a knife edge, not treading on corns at either extreme, but trying to guide you into the real meaning of this text. There are three dimensions to the true doctrine of separation. There is a from and a to and an in. And anyone without the other two is inadequate as a real doctrine of separation. The Pharisees were separated from others, but they were not separated to and they were not separated in. And that's what made their separation from so offensive. Let's take the three. The first three verses talk about the separation from. And I dare not overlook this side. Even if it raises loads of questions in your mind, if it causes you to feel uncomfortable, I've got to say that here is a sentence which is not good advice, but a command from the Lord. Do not be mismated with unbelievers. That's a literal translation. Having given a plea that his heart, the hearts of Christians should be wide open to each other and that they should have affection for each other and him, he now says, but don't let your affections lead you into a mismating with a person who's not a Christian. Now let's look at this word. It is a restriction, a very definite limit to the affections of a Christian. There are two words in it that need defining. The first is the word unbeliever. Now what does that mean? It does not mean someone who doesn't believe in God. Most people in the world believe in God. I would think that probably some 70 to 80 percent of the British people believe there is a God. I'm quoting now from an independent Gallup poll done by the independent television. And something like 75 to 80 percent of people believe in God. Now, if that's what is meant by a believer, then really there's not much difficulty. It's only a minority of at least the British people that you have to worry about. But the word unbeliever in the New Testament means someone who doesn't know Jesus. Jesus said to his own disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. It is that plus that makes the difference between what the New Testament calls a believer and an unbeliever. A believer in the New Testament is someone who knows that Jesus is the Son of God and his Savior. An unbeliever is someone who doesn't know Jesus like that. And therefore this text is about relationships with those who don't know Jesus. Now the real word that we've got to look at carefully is mismated. I think perhaps the authorized version of the Bible is a little misleading at this point where it says unequally yoked. And people go back in the Old Testament to a law in Leviticus that says something about an ox and an ass being used to plow together with a wooden beam over their shoulders with two smaller sticks down at each side resting on their necks in front of their shoulders like this. And that is forbidden by God as cruelty to animals because one will pull harder than the other and the other will chafe and be sore. And it's interesting that God himself is concerned with cruelty to animals and puts it in the law of Moses. And he says, you must never plow with an ox and an ass together. I have been to Palestine and I've seen an ox and an ass yoked together. They are still cruel enough to their animals today to do it. But Jews are forbidden to do it, and they don't do it. It's part of the law of God about animals. And people have got the idea that Paul is saying, don't get unequally yoked, try to pull with someone, it'll chafe you and it'll make it difficult for you. It's something much, much deeper than that. The word is actually a sexual word, and it is rightly translated, do not be mismated. It refers to a very intimate relationship. Much more than working together. Something much deeper than this. Mismated. And there are certain laws in the Old Testament which talk about being mismated. There are some pretty frightening references to horrible vices such as buggery between men and animals. 
There are other laws which absolutely prohibit God's people from trying to breed across species. What God has put asunder, let no man put together, is the gist of the law in the Old Testament about cross-breeding different species and trying to produce something else that is a hybrid. That's not what God intended to be bred. Now, it is this word that is used here. Don't cross-breed different creatures. Now, that's something very much deeper than is traditionally seen in this text. Quite clearly, it does not forbid association with non-Christians. That's not cross-breeding with them. And indeed, it allows a very deep level of friendship with those who are not Christians. The kind of level that Jesus had when he went into their homes and mixed with them and they liked him. And he was known as the friend of publicans and sinners. But what does it refer to? Clearly, it is an intimate relationship. Very intimate indeed. Secondly, it is a relationship that is going to affect quite profoundly both parties involved. Thirdly, it is a relationship that is going to involve a surrender of individual will and freedom and a surrender of conscience. It is also a relationship which is going to produce something that is less than pure, that is less than distinctive of either party. It is going to produce a mixture which is a dilution of both. Now we begin to see the kind of relationship that Paul is getting at. It's the kind of relationship in which a Christian is entering into such a deep relationship with someone who's not a Christian that the ultimate end product is going to be something that is a mixture between the two. In which the distinctive Christian character of the Christian species is going to be diluted and lost and is going to produce something that is not clearly Christian. Now, what relationships could do this? There are four at least that I want to mention. First of all, and the most obvious, is the one that includes this word mate, namely the relationship of marriage. There can be no doubt at all that Paul would include the relationship of marriage. Here, a Christian is absolutely forbidden to marry someone who is not a Christian. That is a hard command. It is terribly hard for a number of reasons. It is hard, harder for girls than boys. Since the church has been very much like a lifeboat for a long time now and put women and children first, there is a shortage of Christian men. Churches that have Sunday schools and women's meetings often have nothing for men. And there is a real shortage of Christian men. And my heart goes out to young girls who come to Christ knowing that one of the results may well be that they will find themselves unable to marry. God has a lovely compensation for such girls. They can give a love to the Lord and to his people that others cannot give. And I'm quite sure that the Lord will reward that openly. Quite sure of that. But it's a hard command and it comes particularly hard when the heart feels natural human affection for someone who has no affection for Jesus. It is a very difficult situation and it's not lightly spoken about. But the fact remains that here is a relationship when two species are being crossed. Two completely different kinds of people are mating and the result of that marriage is a hybrid that is not a true Christian home, but a watered-down version of the real thing. As one preacher used to put it, if you will choose to have the devil for your father-in-law, expect trouble from him. And I'm afraid that is not a joke. It is only too true. The marriage may be fine for a number of years, and then the devil begins to control the marriage. Well, now that is the first relationship and I have got to say that or I wouldn't be true to the word of God. Throughout the Old Testament, Jew was forbidden to marry Gentile. 
and throughout the New Testament, Christian is forbidden to marry unbeliever. The second relationship that might do this, in fact that would, would be a relation in the religious sphere. Let me now be a bit of a prophet. One of the things that I can see coming in the next 50 years on the world scene is this. A very strong pressure for all religions to get together to save the world. I can see that coming. Already the first signs of it are here. The World Congress of Faiths held its meetings in Guildford a year ago. And already there is the suggestion that if we're ever going to save the world, we've got to give it one religion, and that one religion must be made up of all the religions relating together. That would be the cross-breeding of species. It would produce a hybrid that lacked the distinctive qualities of Christianity, and it would be unable to save the world. And we are going to have to resist that kind of relationship. And however much affection at the human level we feel for sincere believers of other religions, and I have met Muslims in Arabia, and my heart was warm to them in their devotion and piety, however much we feel drawn towards the heart, we must not let the head lose control here. It would be a hybrid thing. A third area in which this could happen is in the area of business. A member of our church, who's not here at the moment, came to see me some time ago to ask whether he should go into business, partnership, with someone who is not a Christian. And we looked at this deeply together. We looked at what would be involved in the partnership. We prayed about it. And finally, we came to the conclusion that it was right for him to go into partnership in this business with someone who was not a Christian. And it has proved to be a right and a good thing. And at no point has this Christian's conscience or character or testimony been compromised. But there are some business relationships that would do so. Undoubtedly, there are some partnerships which would make it difficult to give a clear Christian testimony. And the fourth area that we have to look at is the area of friendship. We are called to be the friend of sinners. Our friendship is for all. Indeed, one would love to put a notice up in our church porch, which I think I saw in another church porch somewhere, a stranger is just a friend we haven't yet met. That's a lovely statement to go up in a church. Friends of all. And I hope that anybody listening to me tonight, whether they are Christian or not, feels that we are your friend. We want to be. But we don't want to be a friend of the world to which you belong. The word friendship is used only once in the New Testament, and it's in this text written by the brother of Jesus, a man called James. And James says, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. We want to be a friend of everybody in the world, but we must let our head guard us against our heart, leading us into being a friend of the world in which they are. Do you see the difference? We are called to be friends with everybody in the world, but we are told never to be a friend of the world. And by the world is meant that godless society that is an organized resistance army against God. Jesus loved sinners. He mixed with them, he befriended them, but at not one point in his life did he become a friend of the world in which they lived. Not at one point. Nobody could ever accuse him of compromising with the society of sin in which people lived. It is this delicate line that has to be trodden. Now, I've spent all that time on the first half of verse 14. I must move on much more quickly, but that's the important verse. Now, let's look at how Paul develops it. He says, I'm talking about your heart, lest it run away with you into such a relationship. Let me appeal to your head that you may think straight so that your heart will be kept in its place. And so he appeals to the head to reason with a series of rhetorical questions to which there is only one answer to each. He said, let me argue the point. 
Why should you not get into this kind of relationship with a person who doesn't love Jesus? Well, I ask you these questions. How much is there in common between good and evil? Now, the answer to that one is utterly clear. Nothing. Nothing. There is no point of contact between good and evil, none at all. Let me ask you another question, he says. Use your brains. How much is there in common between light and darkness? Can you mix those two? And the answer is nothing. You can't mix them. You can never have light and darkness in the same place at the same time. Do you remember that service we had here in complete darkness? But there was a torch. Someone held it in the gallery and held it on my face. There was a bit of light here. If there was darkness down there. You can't have both. You can never mix light and darkness. It's either light or it's dark. How much in common have Christ and the devil? The devil thought he could make a partnership with Jesus and he said, look, you bow down to me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Let's, let's go into this thing jointly and we'll have the world between us. The devil thinks that you can have partnerships with Christ. But you can't. How much have Jesus and Satan in common? Nothing. Nothing at all. They're both in this world, but they have nothing in common. Nothing to share. Now, these are not just illustrations. These are the real situation. A believer is someone who has received the righteousness of God. Before that, he was basically evil in his nature. Now, he is basically good. Oh, but you say, I can't accept that. People are not good or evil. They're a mixture. They're not black or white. They're gray. That's how man sees it, but not, that's not how God sees it. Two people may behave rather similarly and appear to be in the middle of the moral range. And yet those two people may be like this. One may be a righteous man who's been dragged down by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The other may be a sinner who's been pulled up by a Christian home, by the influence of a Christian country. And their behavior may look the same, but if you remove the restraints in both cases, one would go to that extreme and the other would go to that. According to God's word, human nature is basically evil. It is lifted up and restrained by so many influences that people who aren't Christians can behave well. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, said Jesus. And when you come to know Jesus, you receive a new nature that is perfect, that's good. The seed of God is in you. That's why you can't go on sinning, says John. The sperm of God is in you. And there's a new nature being born within the womb of your soul. And that's a good nature. And so the difference between an unbeliever and a believer is between someone who's basically righteous, someone who's basically evil. Or put it another way, what happened when you came to know Jesus? why he took us out of the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love where we walk in the light. The difference between when you were not a Christian and when you were, are is the difference between midnight and midday. You're now in the light. The light has shone. You can see. You were once blind and dark. What is the difference between a believer and an unbeliever? A believer belongs to Christ forever, and an unbeliever belongs to Belial. You see, these are not just rhetorical questions. They are expanding the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. It is not too strong to say that a believer and an unbeliever are different species on earth. For if any man is in Christ, the same page on which this is said, there is a new creature, a new creation, a new species. The first man was from the earth, earthy. The new man is from heaven. And as we've borne the image of this species, of Adam, so we shall bear the image of the new species, Christ. And therefore, to get into the relationship that is going to try and produce something together is to mismate, it is to crossbreed species. And this is the real tragic truth. You may rebel against this, you may resent this horrible truth, and yet here it is. There are only two kinds of people in the world. 
not rich and poor, not black and white, not east and west, believer and unbeliever. And there's a gulf fixed between those two that literally means that in the last analysis they have nothing in common. Oh, I know they may catch the same train to work in the morning. I know they may go to the same shops for their food. I know that they may go to the same bank for their money. I know all that. But do you know everything they have in common is temporary and will go? There is nothing they have in common that will last. As soon as those two die, there will be a great gulf between them that can't be bridged and they will have nothing in common at all. Now that is the difference. How can we take two species that have nothing in common and try and crossbreed them to produce something good? Can't be done. And there's the mental argument. But Paul now brings in another note and he says, Would you bring an idol into a temple of God? The Jews had a lovely temple. Oh, it had magnificent furniture and magnificent stonework and carpentry. It was a beautiful building. And God said, this is where I'm going to live among you. You can come and meet me here. You can come and talk to me here. But there is one thing must never come in here, and that's an idol. And it was a complete contrast to all the other temples of the ancient world and of many temples today where you can go in and you can see idols, 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 squat little statues, ugly figures that people kiss and bow down to. God says, no, in the holy of holies where I live it must be empty. No idol. I'm there. No rivals. It would pollute my altar. When Pontius Pilate first came as governor to Palestine, do you know he was very stuck up because he started life as a slave and he was the first slave ever to be made a Roman governor and it went to his head and he marched into Israel and he said, I'm going to teach these Jews a lesson and he brought the image of Caesar and he set it up in the temple and he caused a riot and the blood of Galileans flowed through the streets of Jerusalem. They said this is the most horrible thing this is the abomination of desolation in our temple. And Paul says, you are the temples of God. Are you going to bring an idol into that temple? Yes, I know you may feel that you love this person so deeply that you have such human affection for, it, for them. Be careful. If you bring them into your life in this way, you've brought someone you idolize into the presence of God, someone who doesn't love him. Keep my temples clean. Now Paul goes on to the second part. If we need to separate from unbelievers or from this kind of relationship with them, it is only in order that we may have a closer relationship with God. To be separate from is only in order to be separate to. It is only holding one relationship back that another one might follow. When you put a ring on your finger, you're saying... I'm leaving other people for this deep relationship so that I can be with this one. You will still be friends with others, but what would you think of a girl who said to her fiancé, do you mind if after we get married I stay engaged to that other boy? Well, it may sound ridiculous, but that's what you're doing if you're a Christian and you want to keep a deep relationship with someone who isn't. It's ridiculous. You are freeing yourself from deep relationships with others that you might give yourself to the one who loves you. And Paul, quoting from the Old Testament, makes it quite clear three things. First of all, the basic premise on which he argues is this. God says, I will live among you. I will be your God. You will be my people. That's the basic premise from which we start. But now comes the precept from that premise. Therefore, Away with every person and everything that would spoil that. Come out. I'm thrilled with the word come. God didn't say get out. He did to some. He said to Abraham, get thee out into a country. He said it to Moses and Israel, get out. But here God says, come out, which means I'm not there, I'm here, come. It's not get out, it's come out. Come closer to me. And that will involve coming further from them. But come closer to me. And you notice what the promise is. There's a glorious promise here and it's this. 
your relationship with me will then not just be I will be your God and you will be my people. It will be I will be your father and you will be my children. In other words, there is an intimacy with God that is directly related to our separation. You can say I am God's person and he is my God, but when you have learned the balance of real separation, then you will know God in the intimacy of a family circle. Do you see the change from God to Father, from people to sons and daughters? How well do you want to know God? How near do you want to get to Him? Do you want just to say, I believe in God and I'm among His people? Or do you want to say, Dad, I'm your boy. Which do you want? You cannot have this intimacy with God unless you are prepared to say no to certain people and things. You cannot say yes to Him until you've said no to all that keeps you from Him. This is a promise. It's not a demand. It's an offer. God is saying to you, I'm not trying to take anything away from you. I'm trying to give something to you. You come out and I can have this relationship with you. Give yourself to me and I can love you in a closer way. I can be more intimate with you. You can be with me. What a lovely promise. Well, which do you really want? Intimacy with an unbeliever or intimacy with God. That's what it boils down to. Oh, you could get entangled with an unbeliever and you could still believe in God and you could still belong to his people, but the intimacy will not be there. That loving family relationship will suffer. Sometimes, of course, this happens at a human level where a family profoundly disapproves of someone a son or a daughter has chosen to marry. Sometimes quite wrongly, but it can happen. Do you notice that when the family disapproves, something happens to the family intimacy? Now, when God looks at his children and they start getting entangled with people who don't love him, something happens to the relationship. Something goes wrong. And God says no. Now let me make it quite clear for those of you who are already in relationships that are compromised. Let me say that this passage does not tell you to break the relationship if it is marriage. I must put that in because even though we tackled it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, nevertheless it needs repeating that if you were married before you became a Christian, don't break it up on that account. That's very important. Stay in the marriage. Because a literal translation of verse 14 is this. Do not begin to be mismated with unbelievers. Do not begin. In other words, now that you're a Christian, don't choose to go into that. A Christian for the same reason is forbidden in 1 Corinthians to sell himself into slavery. He may be a slave when he becomes a Christian. He should stay in that relationship. But he should never sell himself into it if he was free when God called him. In other words, after you come to Christ, don't enter into, of your own choice, any relationship that will spoil your relationship with God. Seeing therefore, brethren, that we have such lovely promises, may I finish with the appeal for the third kind of separation. Separation from unbelievers, separation to God, and separation in ourselves. If this is to mean anything, it's got to be carried the whole way right into my life. It's no use my just separating from sinful people if I don't separate from sin here. Therefore, beloved, since we've got such a lovely promise, let's go the whole way and separate ourselves inside from anything in body or spirit that taints or spoils or dirties the relationship that we have with God. It is hypocrisy to separate from others and not to separate from sin. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. And Jesus said, oh, you're white on the outside, but look inside. Why didn't you separate from hatred and envy and all the things that are in your heart? Why didn't you separate from those? For the deepest separation in the Christian life is not from sinners but from sin. And that's got to be done clean and quick. 
I notice that all the verbs in this passage are in a special tense of the Greek language, which means do it quickly, straight away. Don't linger. Don't let time dull your conscience in this. I have noticed this, that when a Christian gets involved in this kind of relationship, the more time they play with it, the less they see it as wrong. The longer they delay cutting the relationship, the more they convince themselves that it's all right. And these verbs say, cut now, cleanse yourself now, get it done straight away, cut it clean and quick and get it, get it out. And that's what we are to do. You know, it's no use praying, God, cleanse my life. It's our job to do the cleansing. The Bible says, let us cleanse ourselves. We can't shelve the responsibility. We can't say it's God's job to make me clean. It's not. The Bible says, you cleanse yourself. Let us cut these things out. It's our job. Let us see that we'll never rest content with less than perfect holiness. What a target. Oh, I've quoted this little doggerel many times to you, but it's so appropriate many times so that it's coming up again. When I was young, I set my goal as far as I could see, but now I'm nearer to my goal, I've moved it nearer me. Every Christian set off to be a saint. Every Christian in their early days wanted to be perfect for the Lord. Every Christian wanted to be holy in every part of their being. Is that not true? I just couldn't believe it if you said, I'm a Christian, but I've never wanted to be perfectly holy. You've wanted to. But how many go on wanting it? How many press on toward the mark and say, I'm not going to rest content with anything less than perfect holiness? What then is the one motive that will help us to go on seeking perfect cleanliness? I'll tell you, it's the fear of God. The fear of God. Now, this is a phrase that is much misunderstood. People say, but surely it's all love now. It's loving God, is it? You read through the book of Proverbs, and that's a wonderful book, especially for young men to read. Billy Graham reads it every week. The fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom, again and again and again. Read through the Psalms. But am I just quoting the Old Testament? No, let me quote the New Testament. Again and again, the fear of the Lord. Paul says it here, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of God. Now, what does that mean? I will tell you. It doesn't mean frightened. It doesn't mean phobia. I've illustrated this difference before, but let me give the illustration of the traffic on the roads. I know people who are afraid to begin to learn to drive because of the traffic on the roads. That's a phobia. But I know people on motorbikes on those roads who have no fear of the traffic, and they're a menace. And I want my children to grow up with a fear of causing an accident that might hurt or even kill someone else. That's a healthy fear, isn't it? Take the fear of heights. The fear of heights is a phobia. I suffer from it to a degree. I don't like heights. It's a phobia tends to keep me away from the edge of a cliff. But I'll tell you what the fear of heights does. It makes you look down. But woe betide a mountaineer who has no fear of falling. But the fear of falling will make him look up because that's the way you overcome the fear of falling. And in this height of holiness, this mountain of sanctity that we are called to climb in the Lord Jesus, there should be no fear of heights that would stop us climbing. But the fear of falling should keep us looking up to Jesus. That's the fear. The fear of hurting God. The fear of hurting someone else wrongly. The fear of putting an obstacle in someone else's way. That's a healthy fear. Let us go on to perfect holiness in the fear of God. My last word is a very practical one. Supposing you are in a situation now and you're not sure whether it's an, a mismating with unbelievers or not, how do you tell 
because it's not always easy to tell when that kind of relationship is coming up. Marriage, I think, is quite clear, but the other relationships I've mentioned, how do you tell when a friendship is, is stepping over this borderline into something wrong? How do you tell when a business colleagueship is stepping over the line? How do you tell when a religious unity is stepping over this line? Well, I will give you just three little practical words. I folded my notes up. I'll have to go back to them. Here's the first. Consult other Christians. Don't trust your own heart or head because your heart can tie your head in knots. It is deceitful and desperately wicked. Consult other Christians. Ask them if it's going to be an unequal yoke. Second, always give God the benefit of the doubt, never yourself. If you have any doubt at all, give God the benefit and cut it. And third, ask yourself, who means more to me, God or this person? And who do I want to be closest to? And when you get the answer to that, get on your knees. Let us pray. Oh, Father, if I've said anything that's not just what you wanted said, then blot it out from our memory. But if this is your word to us, then help us to think it through, to pray it in and to work it out. For your name's sake. Amen.